the way we've done evangelism overall for the past 50 plus years or so, I think the church has really shot itself in the foot. I don't know how anyone can do evangelism without apologetics today. There was a study done amongst uh, Christian millennials, and it said that nearly half of practicing Christian millennials think evangelism is wrong. Hello, everyone. I'm Pastor David Vivas uh, from World Harvest International Church in Delano, California. And so at the time of uh, this uh, taping, uh, it's uh, Sunday, March the 10th, 2024. And uh, I have with me uh, Eric Hernandez, Christian apologist uh, from Dallas, Texas. And so, Eric, uh, you ministered at our church this morning. Yes. You've been to our church uh, several times over the mm -hmm. years. But again, Eric, thank you for joining with us. Um, just for the benefit of those who may not know who you are, just give us a brief introduction. Yeah, so my name is Eric Hernandez. I'm the apologetics lead for Texas Baptist. Um, and that essentially encompasses um, one of my major, uh, one of the major parts of my job is we, um, I help facilitate and organize three, what we call the annual unapologetic evangelism conferences. And then that's just around the state of Texas with one of our affiliated churches. And we've had everyone from Willman Craig, Craig, Lee Strobel, Frank Turek, um, um, you know, people more uh, renowned in the field of apologetics and then, you know, people up and coming in the field of apologetics and catering the conferences to the churches, equipping uh, the congregation to be ready to give a defense for what they believe and why they believe it. I remember years ago when you first came, uh, one of the first times you came to our church, <clears throat> you had a really thick book written by William Lane Craig. And uh, you were the one that introduced me to uh, his ministry. And uh, do you remember bringing that book? It was, it's a really thick book. Yeah, it would have been uh, maybe Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. Yes. And J.P. Moreland co-wrote that, yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, that's how I became acquainted. And uh, so you said that um, uh, you know reading was not necessarily your cup of tea, mm. but uh, you were going to dedicate yourself and go through the entire book. Mm. But that was... Yeah, long time ago, it was. and uh, at that time you hadn't even met Dr. William Lane Craig, mm -hmm. and in in my opinion, he's like one of the most brilliant oh yeah individuals out there. Two PhDs, yeah, knows a few languages, earned. Yeah, that's right. That's Not right. something that he uh, <clears throat> typed up and just printed out on his right. uh, printer at home. Mm -hmm. These are actually earned. But if people have never uh, seen a debate by Dr. William Lane Craig, they, they really should do so. Mm -hmm. And so I know that uh, he was one of them. Another gentleman that you mentioned is Lee Strobel. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us who Lee Strobel is. So uh, he has a fascinating uh, story. Um, he was a journalist, um, I believe the Chicago Tribune. Um, and <clears throat> his wife, uh, long story short, his wife gets saved and he uses his uh, journalistic investigative skills to look into Christianity. And um, there's, a, there's a good movie I'd recommend. I don't recommend too many Christian movies because sometimes they're not good. Uh, but I would say The Case for Christ is a very good uh, movie mm -hmm. about the life of Lee Strobel and, and how he came to Christ. And, um, you know, it's a movie, so there are some things that, you know, change here and there for, for the cinematic sake. But was an atheist, investigated Christianity, and at the end saw that Christianity was true and gave his life to Christ. Yeah, uh, that that's a great movie. I, I, uh, I'm i not a big fan of movies, but that is one that I would uh, certainly recommend. Uh, a fascinating story and an excellent testimony, and uh, you had a chance to meet with him and uh, do conferences together, mm -hmm. or he's been one of your right. speakers. And yeah, you, you've met all He kinds endorsed of, the book as well. Yeah. And he endorsed your book. Tell us about right. your book here. Oh, this one, yeah. <laughs> so it's called the the lazy approach to evangelism, a simple guide for conversing with non-believers. And um, you know, th there's really a nothing inherently lazy about the approach, uh, but it's meant to convey a minimalist approach, if you will. Where, you know, I, I see even apologists um, because they've learned so much about a certain topic, they're usually eager to share about it, but. It depends on the context who you're talking to and how much time you have. Uh, a lot of people I witness to, I may never see again. So I have to be most effective in the little time that I have. How can I plant a seed, be effective, and make the most of the opportunity that I'm given? And so, um, like I shared this morning, the example of this young lady. <clears throat> she said, I'm an atheist. And I said, why are you an atheist? And she said, because I can only believe things that are backed up by logic and evidence. And I asked, well, given you're an atheist, what logic and evidence do you have for your belief there's no God? 
and she immediately said the Bible is full of contradictions. And my response was, I said, well, how does that prove there's no God? And her looking confused, I said, let me put it this way, because no one's asked her that before. She's used to jumping into a debate as soon as she brings it up. And I said, if God exists, did he exist before the Bible was written? And she says, well, I don't believe in God. I said, no, I understand that, but just humor me here. If he did exist, did he exist before the Bible was written? And she says, well, yeah, I guess if he exists. I said, great. So even if I can see the Bible is full of contradictions, I don't, but let, let's say it is for the sake of argument. How would that make God stop existing or prove that atheism is true? What am I missing here? And note here, I, I'm not arguing with her. I'm not getting into a debate. I'm making the most use of my time, planting a seed, and hence what I call the lazy approach to evangelism. Okay, let's back up a little bit. Define what a Christian apologist is. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> First Peter 3.15 says, Set Christ apart in your heart as Lord. And always be ready to give a logical defense. Some translations may say answer. And if you were to look up that word answer or defense in Greek, you would see the Greek word apologia, which is where we transliterate and get the English word apologetics. And it says be ready to give an answer or a defense, essentially for what you believe, why we believe it. So the first thing I'd like to point out here is that this is a New Testament commandment, not suggestion, not saying this would be fun for youth lock-in. It might be. But this is a New Testament commandment to every New Testament believer that we are all called, again, not suggested, but commanded to be ready to give an answer, a defense for what we believe, why we believe it. And this is something that we should all be prepared to do uh, um, no matter where we're at or, or who we encounter. One of the greatest apologists in the New Testament is Paul the Apostle. Yes, he did. He was one that went directly into the synagogues and he would uh, debate with the elders and those that held to traditions and to prove that Jesus indeed was the Christ. Right. And I, I look at Paul. He was a man that was a defender of the faith. He was a man that was not afraid of confrontation, not just for the sake of confrontation, right. but to convince. And, mm -hmm. and that's uh, one of the commands that um, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write when he says, preach the word, be instant, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. One translation says to convince. Mm -hmm. And um, this is something that as an apologist, uh, you teach, you help equip the body of Christ to learn to defend the gospel, how to propagate the gospel, because we want to plunder hell and populate heaven. Mm -hmm. We're here on this earth to fulfill the Great Commission, which right. as a pastor, um, I, I, I consistently um, encourage my congregation here to witness, preach to the lost, mm. the gospel. Uh, inviting people to church is not preaching the gospel. Right. Preaching the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ is the gospel. And uh, do you see that there is a lack of that today in the body of Christ at large? Because you, tra you travel, you travel a lot. Yes, um, that's a really good question. And, and you know, sometimes it, it depends who you ask or where you go, but a few things. Um, the studies do show that uh, there is a, a lack of, of evangelism um, in many instances, and, and the reason being is, some people are afraid that they will be asked a question they can't answer. So they would rather just not speak up at all. Uh, but that also goes to show that the kind of culture that we live in, I, I, I don't know how anyone can do evangelism without apologetics today. There's an apologist named Bobby Conway. He said, when someone tells you that they don't need apologetics, they have just revealed to you how little evangelism they actually do. Um, on the other hand, there was a study, and I quote the study in my book with the reference and, you know, where you can find it. There was a study done amongst uh, Christian millennials, and it said that nearly half of practicing Christian millennials think evangelism is wrong. Now, in doing some research for the book, and, and even today, if you just go, I don't know, somewhere, Christian bookstore, just look at, you know, manuals on evangelism, I, I would I venture to say that the way we've done evangelism overall for the past 50 plus years or so, I think the church has really shot itself in the foot. And when you look at the study, uh, a few things stood out to me. 
first it said something like, uh, of course, again, half of practicing Christian millennials think evangelism is wrong. But within the same study, it said that um, most of them said that the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to come to know Jesus, which is great. And then I think 75 or so percent of them said they actually felt gifted and equipped to share their faith with someone else. But then why then would half of them feel it's wrong to evangelize? Well, I'll give you the nutshell. And and from what I read from this, <clears throat> the way we've done evangelism, our gospel pitches today are typically something like this. Look what God did in my life. Uh, look, look how much better my family is, my marriage is. And if you become a Christian, you can get this too. The problem with that is that, one, that's not the gospel. Two, I cannot guarantee someone that they will have a better marriage, family, whatever the case is, if they become Christians, because, again, that is not the gospel. And three, if people convert on that basis, note they are already converting on the basis of it being centered around them, not God. So Christianity just because it becomes another way in which they look to fulfill some type of need or desire that they have personally. And so what happens here is you have people converting on this basis of seeking happiness, if you will. And when that person begins to study the doctrines of Christianity, well, they see that these doctrines actually impede on my happiness. And so even when you look at these celebrity deconversions, they come out and say, I'm no longer Christian. And, and you see this with, you know, some popular Christian artists that were, you know, Christian artists when I grew up or something to that effect. And they'll come out and say, I'm no longer a Christian and I'm so much happier now. And my thought is always, well, no offense, but what does it matter how happy you are? I want to know if it's true. But then you stop and think, well, wait a minute. Why would they say that? Well, because that's the gospel. That's how the gospel was pitched to them. And again, if I become a Christian on the basis of seeking happiness, but then discover that Christianity actually hinders my happiness, well, it only makes sense to, to find a different religion. So, so I think, you know, you have this on the one hand, there's not enough evangelism happening it happening like like we'd like to see now on the other hand you see the evangelism that is happening it, it, it we set people up for failure we set people up to have these false theological beliefs about god so that when their life doesn't go the way they think it should well then now they're angry at god on the expectation that is unbiblical to begin with and then when you look back to that study about half of practicing uh christian practicing millennials think it's wrong well in our culture today, one of the dominant strongholds is known as postmodernism or relativism. And essentially, it's the idea that truth and reality is relative to my experience. Well, if we define, if, if in the study, these millennials saw evangelism as simply sharing my experience with someone else, well, then, yeah, I can see why 75 plus percent would feel gifted and equipped. If evangelism simply means I talk about myself, sure. I, I don't know very many millennials who aren't gifted and equipped at talking about themselves. Um, but then it dawns on, on you when you think, well, then maybe that's why they think it's wrong, because if my experiences are different than yours, then it becomes perhaps intolerant or wrong of me to say my experiences are more valid than yours. But that all, again, comes back to the idea that it's your experiences that validate Christianity as opposed to, I don't know, God exists and Jesus rose from the dead. And if we can evangelize on the basis of this is true, First and foremost, not necessarily look how good of a person I am, look, look how great my family is, but God exists, Jesus rose from the dead. I think we can avoid a lot of things that we've really set ourselves up or set other people up for in the future. Now, that's what Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians 15. Everything falls on the resurrection. Mm -hmm. I mean, without right. the resurrection of Christ, everything is pointless. Yeah. Everything about the Christian faith is useless. Yeah. And so... There's evidence, historical evidence, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I believe that's why Lee Strobel came to faith mm -hmm. in Christ, because okay. of his uh, persistent research into the historical documents. Because atheists like Lee Strobel wouldn't go to the Bible, open it up, and here is a resurrection story, and he believed it and became a believer. That's not mm -hmm. what happened right. with him in his case. And so he went a little bit deeper to his credit in discovering that mm. the biblical account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is indeed true. 
Now, for the person in the congregation that does not have, um, that, that, that hasn't gone to, ha- had any kind of theological training, any training in Christian apologetics, well, pastors should already be equipping the people through the teaching of the word mm-hmm. every time people meet. Now, this is a concern that uh, every pastor has, uh, a, par- a pastor that really has a genuine interest in reaching the lost, yeah. is that people in the congregation are not doing what they should be doing, that is uh, preaching the gospel, witnessing, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And again, as you said a moment ago, um, for whatever reason, the excuses that they come up with, they somehow don't feel qualified. Here, here's what bothers me. Okay, so I was raised in a spirit-filled environment, spirit-filled churches. Whenever you ask a person, this is not everybody, but this is sure. what I've heard over the years. Um, how do you know that God is real? Well, because I can feel him. Is that convincing to an atheist? <laughs> it's not convincing to me. <laughs> um, in fact, as Christians ourselves, you know, Scripture talks about testing the Spirit. And if someone came to you and said, Pastor Vivas, I feel that the Holy Spirit spoke to me in my heart that I'm supposed to start doing this in your church. Well, I don't even think, I don't know if you'd have to pray about some of those things to begin with, depending on what they say, right? If someone says something totally unbiblical, well, you don't have to pray about that. No, the Holy Spirit did not tell you that. Or no, you did not. Um, I'm not saying you didn't feel that, but maybe that's the wrong spirit. <laughs> but that's a whole other story. Um, but right, uh, we ha- here, it, playing on what you're saying here or adding to what you're saying, um, as I mentioned, you know, um, I, go, I take a, a group of students to Utah at least once a year. We go out there uh, witnessing to Mormons. And what, what concerns me is how eerily close Christians today evangelize like Mormons do. You cannot out-nice a Mormon. They're the nicest people you've ever met. And you cannot out-testimony a Mormon because they, it's like they practice it and work on that. But... If someone were to come up to me and say, I want to look, and I'm, I'm considering choosing a religion, where should I start? I would say start with Christianity. Now, you might think, well, you say that because you're a Christian. No, not necessarily. Here's why I say that. <clears throat> Christianity is the one religion that you can study in an external way. What do I mean by that? Well, if we just contrast Christianity and Mormonism, in Mormonism, it's something internal, typically a filling Typically what they call a burning in the bosom. If you want to know if the Book of Mormon is true, pray about it. The Holy Spirit will give you the burning in the bosom. Well, there's no way I can objectively, externally verify that. I I don't know if you had that burning or not. Now contrast that with 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, to paraphrase, Christianity is false. And not only is it false, he goes as far as to say, people should feel sorry for us for how dumb and gullible we were to believe this to begin with. So, with Christianity, there's something external, objectively, objectively verifiable that you can look at. What is the evidence for the resurrection? Versus something like Mormonism, it's something internal and personal that I have no idea how to check. So, if you start with Christianity, and you find that the resurrection did not occur, then continue searching. But if you start with Christianity, and you found the resurrection did occur, stop searching because you found it. So, yeah, absolutely. I got a couple of questions here that came in, but by the way, somebody uh, complimented uh, your suit, Eric. Though that's not a question. Uh, says, does Dr. Craig dress as sharp as Eric? I think not. Okay, that's just an opinion, and uh, opinion are a dime a dozen. But anybody is entitled to an opinion. All right. But this appreci- is, by the way, that's a friend of mine. Uh, he calls himself the Faithiest Atheist. The Faithiest Atheist. Actually, one of our volunteers at our conferences comes to everyone and volunteers. Wow. You have an atheist who comes and uh, supports what we do and volunteers are time to help us out and put these conferences together. Well, I'm sure after meeting you, he, he appreciates uh, the fact that, uh, you know, you're open-minded and he sees that. And uh, so appreciate you uh, watching. Not sure what His state he's Richard. from. His name's Richard. Yeah, he's from uh, Arizona. Arizona. Okay. I have a friend, Richard, but he's from... Uh, 
Washington State. So, Richard, if you're watching from Washington State, and if you have a comment or question, uh, jump in and address uh, and, and uh, just give us a shout. Okay. All right. So here's the first question: uh, Do all religions ultimately point to the same God? Why or why not? Um, <laughs> no. Why or why not? Because first, they don't claim to. <laughs> um, when you look at, yeah, and, and, you know, not knowing exactly what the person's thinking of when they ask this, but, I mean, just look at Islam and Christianity. They clearly are not pointing to the same God because of the um, attributes that, they, um, that they're that they exhibiting. So, for example, uh, we believe in a triune God, tripersonal God, one God, three persons. In the Islamic concept of God, you don't, you don't have, uh, it's, it's one person, whereas we believe in a trinity. Now... Can they both be right? I would say no, and, I, and I'm trying to think how deep to go here. <clears throat> so, the Christian and Muslim will agree that God is necessarily all-loving. Now, to say that something is necessarily or essentially all-loving means that the thing in question cannot lose the attribute of being all-loving and still be the thing in question. So, for example, uh, the property of being even is essential to the number two. That means if, that the number two cannot cease to be even, otherwise it wouldn't be the number two. With this in mind, if God is essentially all loving, then he would have to be all loving from eternity past. But here's a problem with that in Islam, I say. Before God created any person, any angel, anything else, I would ask, how can God be essentially all loving when there's no one to love? other than himself, which is kind of more narcissistic. However, if you have a Trinitarian God, then from eternity past, not only do you have a person to share and, and be a, in mutual relation and fellowship and um, having an exchange of love, you have this from eternity past, if God is uh, uh, necessarily triune, and now you have a God that is able to be essentially necessarily from eternity past all loving because now you have more than one in the Godhead, whereas in Islam you can't have that. So I would say on the Islamic conception of God, you cannot have a God that is essentially all loving if there's no person to love before he creates anything else, whereas on the Christian uh, conception of God you can. So automatically they are pointing to different gods. Same thing with Mormonism, same thing with all these other religions. They don't all agree um, on the fundamental things, so they clearly can't be pointed to the same God because some of them actually posit more than one God. So even within their own uh, uh, doctrines of different religions, they don't claim to point to the same place. Well, without getting to the doctrine of the Godhead, because even within Christian circles, there's differences of opinion on sure. the Godhead. Uh, there's the oneness, mm -hmm. and there's, uh, there's those who uh, affirm that Jesus <laughs> is not God. There's groups like that. Right. Well, I'm going to call uh, them Christian, but yeah. Th yeah, yeah they're, well, they're non-Christian. <laughs> sure, uh, right, right. But uh, I, I would go... I would go this route and and see what see what your thoughts are. Sure. But um, and and it'd be great if we have a person that's a Muslim that is watching if they can, you know, comment and just to see if if what we're saying is is correct or incorrect because we're open to that. Sure. But Muslims can't call non-Muslims infidels. And um, in the Quran, it states that uh, infidels are to be put to death. Mm. Now, that is an extreme view um, from the Muslims. <clears throat> now, of course, again, and, and I really don't want to get into this topic, and of course I know some will say, well, but the Old Testament, you know, has uh, ordered God's people to destroy the enemies. And again, uh, they try to make that comparison there. But if you look at Muslims, again, uh, it's 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 a different religion. You go if you go to the uh, religion of Confucius, if you go to the religion of Baha'u Allah, um, the Hare Krishnas, you can go on and on. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many world religions there are. I, I forget how many religions alone are in India. You yeah. got the Hindus, you got the Sikhs, you, and of course all the other thousands of religions. So again, the question: Do all religions lead to the same God? Is no, no, <laughs> of course not, because. Jesus emphatically said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through 
me. That's right. what the Lord Jesus Christ said. So, no, not all religions lead to the same God. Okay, so here's the second question. <clears throat> Isn't hell an unreasonable punishment for not believing in a specific set of truth claims? And again, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a loaded question with some presuppositions that I would want to know what the person means by, uh, by what they're asking uh, for a few reasons. So one, no one goes to hell for not believing in a set of, as he put it, a specific set of truth claims. That's not why people go to hell. People go to hell for rejecting the revelation that God has given to them and not responding positively to the revelation they have. Um, so that's the first thing I would, I would point out. No one goes to hell out of ignorance. I'll put it that way. Um, without going into all the details in Scripture, suffice to say, even in Scripture you find things like, had I not known the law, I wouldn't have known what, what sin was. There seems to be this age of accountability implicitly within Scripture. Um, and I would say that, for example, because this is also related to the question of, what about those who have never heard the gospel? And I go back to say, no one's going to hell because of where they were born, or because they were ignorant of something, or because they accidentally, I don't know, believed, uh, were, were misled, or something to that effect. Romans one twenty <clears throat> says that, um, again, Paul, I, I, love, I, I love reading Paul. He, he's very clever with his words. Uh, he would often use a play on words. In Romans one twenty, he says, Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen. Well, how does something invisible become clearly seen? And he elaborates to say that through God's handiwork, through his workmanship, we are able to, and I'm paraphrasing, we are able to deduce attributes of God's nature by simply studying the creation. So, if I were to study, if an alien race came down here and, and looked at one of our vehicles, and looked at the pedals, looked at the AC, looked at, you know, all these things, it, it would give them a, an idea of the mind of the mechanic that made the vehicle. And the more you study the vehicle, the more you would learn about the, the mind of the mechanic that made it that way. In the same way, when you look at creation, and in my book, I go over four plus arguments for God's existence. This is known as natural theology. Theology we can derive simply by looking at creation itself, which is what I think Romans 120 is getting at. And so it says, he goes on to say, and they are without excuse because God has made these things plain to them. So just by reflecting on nature itself, on creation itself, we can come to a knowledge of God, and I think everyone is given a measure of faith, as Scripture says, and it's going to depend on how this person responds to the faith or the light or revelation that God gives them. So to reiterate, no one goes to hell <clears throat> out of ignorance or because they were born in the jungle in the middle of nowhere. Everybody is given a, a, a level of revelation, even if it's simply through natural theology, and it's going to depend on how they respond to that. And God's not going to send someone to hell because they said, oh, you're born in the wrong family, too bad. Scripture says there was that excuse. I think everyone's going to have their chance on this side of heaven, and all things being equal, if for some reason, let's say, um, w without going to the exceptions, and by that I simply mean, like, let's say, uh, a two-month-old baby or something like that who, who did not have the cognitive capacity to respond. I think God's grace, justice, and mercy is big enough to cover all of that so no one can get to heaven on the judgment day and say, I didn't have a fair chance. And over the years, I've heard various uh, ministers from Pentecostal groups teach that uh, a child born into a family that was not believers, but the baby happened to, let's just say the baby dies of crib death or something, mm -hmm. that that baby goes directly to hell because mom and dad were sinners. Wow. That's, that's a very cruel teaching right there. And uh, as, as believers, followers of Christ, um, we know that the Bible does not teach that. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. And so there's, there's, uh, there's uh, beliefs within... The Christian faith that vary from denomination to denomination. Uh, there is the essential doctrines, and then there is right. the non-essential. And so uh, I, I know that uh, the essential doctrines would be like the physical and bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. I emphasize the physical and bodily because right. there's some segments under the guise of Christianity, right. like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they uh -huh. claim to believe in the resurrection, 
but uh, they don't believe in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you were to ask them uh, mm -hmm. and you were to try to pin them down, they will eventually admit, no, we don't believe in the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. What happened to the body that was buried, somehow that body got disintegrated and Jehovah God created and formed a new body or a fake body that never resurrected, that never was crucified. Of course, in their case, they say impaled. Christ wasn't crucified because he got in a torture state. Yeah. So they serve a different Jesus. So with, with and of course, getting back to the question, um, the concept of hell, hellfire, <clears throat> as a believer, as a follower of Christ, believer in the Bible, that teaching has always bothered me. Sure. And I'm being very candid, mm -hmm. and it has always bothered me. I believe it right. because that's what Jesus taught. That's what the book of Revelation teaches, the fate of the person who rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. And, but it's always bothered me, I guess, because as a human being, you know, we, we begin to think about, wow, who, why would our Heavenly Father, a loving God, create such a horrible place? Mm. But that's how much he detests sin. He's holy, and sin is unholy it, it, and and when a person who we're all born into sin and shape and inequity but when we surrender our hearts to the lord jesus christ he forgives us and we sanctifies us we're redeemed we're washed in his blood and so god no longer sees us contaminated with sin but the person who rejects the lord jesus christ who dies in their sins that's why a person is sent into eternity without the Lord, uh, well, in, a, in a Christless eternity, hellfire, because that's how much God detests sin, and sin was a part of them. But again, that, that, that subject has always, I know I spoke to you about it once, uh, and other ministers, but that is the reality, unfortunate reality of the person who dies without Christ. And that's the reason why we, there's an urgency to preach the gospel. There's an urgency. Now, um, again, if you just joined us, please, if you have any questions that you would like to ask or even make any comments or statements, please place those in the comment section below. Uh, you said earlier a moment ago when we were talking about apologetics when you were explaining, and uh, we have a different culture today. We have a evolving culture, a culture that seems to be getting further and further away from appreciating uh, Christianity, appreciating uh, Christ, the finished work of Christ. And uh, so you, you have a very secular society today that in many cases doesn't even respect the clergy, doesn't respect anything to do with uh, the gospel. And I know personally firsthand I've experienced that. I don't experience it a whole lot. I mean, most people I meet are nice people, but, mm. but there's a segment of people that... Um, when they find out that you're a Christian or a preacher, the criticisms, the yep. um, the accusations, without even knowing you, mm -hmm. because uh, there's a stereotype, a conclusion that they've arrived at that all Christians are hypocrites. How do you address that? <laughs> uh, well, as I said this morning, you know, uh, one, it's not an argument. Um, so if someone says, if someone were to say, Eric, Christians are hypocrites, my response would be, go on, and I would just sit in silence, awkward silence, uh, because it's not an argument. Um, it neither proves nor disproves Christianity. <clears throat> I, I, I like to, to put it this way. Um, suppose, because, you know, growing up, you know, if I saw or felt the church wasn't doing something right, my thought wasn't, oh, God must not exist. If anything, my thought was, well, this needs to stop and someone needs to do something about it or make a change, and, well, my goodness, why not me? I'm not saying I was a solution by any means, but I could at the very least not be part of the problem if the church was doing something they shouldn't. And I don't necessarily, even necessarily mean immoral. I just mean, well, if the church is not teaching apologetics or the church is not taking people's questions seriously, you know, fill in the blank. And <clears throat> so first and foremost, when it comes to uh, the question was about, um, say that again, the, the last part. Um, in regards to... Uh, there's a stereotype. The ser that's right. The stereotype, yes. Okay. So what, what kind of boggles my mind is this. If, if, let's say, we were to be taught by the best math teacher in the world, 
and this math teacher teaches us the laws of mathematics and we take a test and we fail it. Do we blame A, the laws of mathematics, or B, do we blame ourselves because we did not apply the laws of mathematics that were taught to us? Well, B. So you cannot blame the laws of mathematics or say math is false because we fell a test and failed to apply the laws. And in the same way, you cannot claim Christianity is false because the people professing to be Christians failed to apply the principles that Christ instructed us to live by. And, and I don't see how people see that as an objection. If people failing a math test does not disprove mathematics, then Christians being hypocrites does not disprove Christianity. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we will admit that there are people in churches today who are hypocrites. They Absolutely. live, they live double lives. They live, they, they, they live a pretentious life. Sure. They, they live a life <clears throat> one way in the church and a totally different way outside of the church. So, you know, we, we know that. But so do atheists. Sure, that's right. So do most people that uh, don't value integrity and uh, don't have a moral compass. Uh, which, by the way, um, here, here's, a, uh, here's another point that I, I want to, or I want to ask this question and then get your point of view. Um, let me make this statement first. Some people say about atheists. Oh, atheists are all <clears throat> evil people. Atheists just want to sin. Uh, atheists hate Christians, I don't find that to be the case uh, at all with, with the ones that I have met over the years. And I'm sure you've met a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some, again, and, and we can't just say, well, atheists are arrogant. Well, I know a lot of preachers that are arrogant. Yeah. You know, That's you right. turn on the TV and you can see the arrogance all over them. That's right. Bragging about their mansions, bragging about their, how much money they have, et cetera, et cetera. That's another topic. Maybe we need to do another <laughs> time. But um, not all people that have money are arrogant. But the point is, getting back to the atheists, you know, wh why is it that some Christians, and again, you have more experience in dealing with atheists, but why is it that some Christians come to that conclusion that atheists are mean, they're evil, they're hateful, they just hate all Christians? Why do they come to that conclusion? What has been your experience? Uh, because they don't know any atheists, <laughs> personally. Good point. <laughs> um, it's true. I, I won't mention the church. I was, I was consulting with the church once, and they were asking how to reach certain demographic and generation. And I said, well, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to host a debate at your church about the questions that these young people in this generation are asking? Are you willing to go meet them where they're at? Are you willing to, you know, go to these places? Are you willing to step outside the walls of your church and this and that? And then uh, I did a brief atheist role play with them. Let's see how you would interact if I were a millennial atheist. And, you know, we did it for about 10 minutes. And, you know, let's just say it wasn't good. And then one lady seemed kind of annoyed, and she raised her hand and says, well, look, I don't know any atheists, so how could I use any of this stuff you're showing us? And my first thought was, you don't know any atheists, and you think that's a good thing? Like, are you bragging about that? <laughs> I said, because who are you witnessing to if you don't know any non-believers? Atheists, you know, skeptic, fill in the blank. And, and, and so, yeah, people uh, who would come to that conclusion, I would say, have, don't know any atheists personally. Uh, my friend I just mentioned, Richard Suttles, um, or the faithiest atheist, rather. Um, yeah, he's one of the nicest, loving guys you've ever met. Um, sure, we have our disagreements, but, I mean, yeah, it's... Th there are stories, interesting stories I can share about him where, you know, people see him at this conference, assume he's a Christian, and they're talking about, like, I don't know, morality, and, you know, they're, you know we, we allow people to um, set up tables for their ministry and stuff like that at some of these conferences, and one lady was talking with Richard and said something like, Oh, yeah, you know, we, we do these things to help people, to help the poor, and this and this, and, you know, we want to be moral. And she, and she said something like, not knowing Richard was an atheist, said something like, yeah, because, you know, atheists wouldn't care about being moral like this. And uh, Richard's like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm an atheist. And she took like two or three steps back, like, all of a sudden he, was, he had a gun in his hand. Wow. But the mentality is... is <laughs> Like, she was perfectly fine talking with him and trusting him until he knew he was an atheist, and all of a sudden something changes. Um, so, yeah, they, they don't know, uh, they, they just don't know atheists, and I think it's a stigma. I also think sometimes in churches we paint with a broad brush and we make them out to be the enemy, when, quite frankly, atheists are not our enemies. If anything, they are people made in the image of God. They're not our enemies. We, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says that we tear down, we demolish, Paul uses harsh language, we demolish and destroy strongholds, 
which he defines essentially as false ideas or beliefs that keep people from uh, keep people from coming to a knowledge of God. But 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says that we destroy or demolish strongholds, not that we destroy and demolish people. There's a difference. We attack and demolish the ideas, not the person. We want to win uh, the, the person. We want to get them to the foot of the cross because at the end of the day, they're not, they're not our enemies. They are people made in God's image. Yeah, and uh, for those that are watching, uh, just give us a brief description uh, or definition of an atheist and agnostic. <clears throat> yeah, so I think this is the third, maybe fourth chapter of my book. I kind of go into the three types of non-believers you may encounter. And let me, let me start with a caveat, um, and I explain this in the book as well. So, historically, the definition of an atheist is one who believes there is no God or gods. That is the standard, scholarly, historic definition of what it meant to be an atheist. However, nowadays, atheists have begun to try and, I would say, redefine that. Uh, I won't go into the details why, but they'll say something like... Um, to be an atheist simply means I lack belief in God. Well, that, that's very ambiguous and vague because an agnostic historically is someone who does not hold a belief one way or the other. So before I go into unpacking them, I am what you call a theist. You are a theist. A theist is someone who believes in God or a God or gods. An atheist is someone who does not believe or believes that there are no God or gods, so they believe God or gods do not exist. An agnostic takes no position one way or the other. So here, here's an illustration uh, to kind of think on this. Suppose um, the Super Bowl is happening, you know, somewhere here this year. And, and then there's this news crew out asking people who they think, you know, if the home team, do you think the home team is going to win? And they go to person A and they ask person A, do you think the home team will win the Super Bowl? And person A says, yes, I believe the home team will win. Then they go to person B. Do you believe that the home team will win the Super Bowl? And person B says, no, I think the home team will lose the Super Bowl. And then they go to person C and says, well, what about you? Do you think they're going to win or lose? And person C says, I don't know. I, I just, I don't watch football. I don't care. So the theist will be like person A. I believe that they will win. I believe God does exist. Person B would be like the atheist, I believe they'll lose, or I believe God does not exist. Person C would be like the agnostic, I don't hold a view one way or the other. Um, for, for those, again, who are, who are watching, again, I'm speaking to Eric Hernandez, a Christian apologist from Dallas, Texas. If you have a comment or question, uh, please place those in the comment section below, and... Uh, will be notified of your question. Now, there was a question that came in earlier, which is totally uh, off, seems to be uh, just totally different subject. And that is a subject of marriage and divorce. A person uh, asked, uh, if a person divorces, will they go to hell? That's the question that I, I believe I'm phrasing it uh, correctly. And so I'm Hopefully I hadn't restated that question, so person uh, is waiting for you to respond to that. Yeah, and they may, may have misunderstood from this morning's service. With, they can also go on your page and see the service from this morning. Um, so uh, this morning we talked about Jesus' engagement with the Sadducees, and the Sadducees used what you would call in philosophy a thought experiment, a hypothetical scenario of a lady who gets married to one guy and given the law of Moses, when he dies she has to marry someone else. And, so it had nothing to do with divorce. Uh, it had to do with the Sadducean belief or Sadduceans belief that there was no afterlife or resurrection. And then the Sadducees trying to put Jesus in a trap saying, if you believe in an afterlife, then who's this woman's, who will this woman be married to in heaven in the afterlife at the resurrection? The first guy are all seven of them. So the, the question, and, and, and interestingly too, even in that, in what the Sadducees are saying, there's no divorce. The guy dies each time. So there's no divorce to begin with even there. Uh, but no, uh, no one's going to go to, to hell because they've gotten a divorce. You, a, a, you know, earlier you were talking about hell and, you know, how um, it's a horrible place. You know, what, what some people don't realize or fail to realize is that hell was not made for us. It was made for Satan and his angels. So it was never intended for us. But without going into a whole unpacking on hell, you know, you said it, it, it's something that bothers you. 
I agree with you. I like what um, a, a an apologist and scholar, Clay Jones, once said that you know he does he does this class and you know they go into the doctrine of hell, and one student said, "It just bothers me, and I and I want this class to help it not bother me." And he said, "If you're a Christian, hell should bother you, and it's never going to not bother you." <laughs> and and that was really really interesting and, and sobering, um, <clears throat> but nevertheless. People are not going to go to hell again for ignorance or it's not like, oh, I, I messed up this one time on accident or something. I'm going to hell. A person is going to hell for rejecting God. I like how C.S. Lewis essentially put it. The gates of hell are locked from the inside. It, it's it's the, the I, I dare say that the anguish and the gnashing of the teeth, if you look at that phrase gnashing of the teeth, it's almost like um, it's almost like someone shaking their fist at God where to the point to where. Don't hear me saying I believe this, but hypothetically, if people could leave hell, C.S. Lewis says, well, they want it even if they could because the gates are locked from the inside. And the gnashing of the teeth implies, I hate you so much and I will never bow the knee to you. So, so don't think of people in hell like, oh my gosh, we wish we can go up there. Man, I really wish I can get out of here and go to heaven. They don't want to be. When you look at the rich man and Lazarus, however you take that story, the rich man doesn't say, get me out of this place. He just, he's still trying to tell Lazarus what to do. Hey, tell him to come, you know, put his finger on my tongue. Still trying to boss him around, but you don't see him saying, oh, and, and, and I need to get out of here, so to speak. So hell, I think, is, again, locked from the inside. And the way C.S. Lewis put it, which I think is, is brilliant, is at the end of the day, God will give everyone what they ask for, including total separation from him. And what could be more fair than that? Yeah, God gives every person free choice. Now, the church today, um, and of course, I don't know every, we don't know every congregation. I only know what I hear, what I've seen firsthand. Uh, there's apathy in a lot of churches today. They are apathetic, meaning it's like no big deal. Christianity, the gospel, uh, the Great Commission, no big deal. And this is very bothersome because I think about the mortality of people. I think that that individual, the person that we see on the street, the person that we should be evangelizing, uh, today could be their last day. And this could be the only opportunity for them to hear the gospel. But if we are apathetic, like we don't care about the things of God, we don't care about um, our, our faith, we don't care about our witness, um, that's very bothersome when, when this is the attitude that I see, not just in, in my local congregation, that's not everyone, but I've, I've seen it in certain people. It's like, no big deal. Mm. And that reminds me of the parable. Remember the parable of the uh, wedding where the uh, king made a um, banquet invitation. for his mm. son, sent out invitations? Mm -hmm. And... The Bible says when he sent out invitations and the people, you know, usually when you send invitations out, you send them out to family and friends that you personally know. And to be invited to a, a wedding of royalty, that's yeah. a big deal. And when they received the invitations, the Bible says that they murdered the servants who delivered mm -hmm. the invitations. And they basically said they, was, they took it lightly. They, one translation says they took it very lightly. Do you, again, in your travels, and I know that... Um, you 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 may have seen this over the years. You you may see this in your travels. But uh, do you see apathy uh, in <clears throat> congregations today? Absolutely. Um, yes. Sometimes even I mean, apathy in different areas. Um, so in in one specific area, I, I remember. Um, I won't mention the person or the name, but it was a, a big event happening somewhere in Texas, and um, I was invited to be part of the luncheon, of the planning process of what they were thinking of doing. They wanted to fill a stadium and all this stuff. And um, they were talking about doing uh, breakout sessions on reaching certain people groups. <clears throat> Afterwards, um, again, without going into the details, I said I, I would love to do something on reaching non-believers. And the person basically said, yeah, well, that's such a small minority group. And, you know, to even do that, you have to go into these, and you have to learn this stuff, and apologetics can be complicated, and kind of just seem to be apathetic towards it. And my thought is, wait a minute, so you're trying to do this event to reach everyone. 
unless it comes to this group that takes a little bit too much work. Like, so I guess we just neglect them. And, and, and it's almost like apathy out of laziness, not the, not the good kind of laziness, if you will, but an intellectual laziness, a, 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 a spiritual laziness. Um, on top of that, apathy even within just not caring to equip, we, we, we're looking for quick fixes. Um, and, you know, so if the youth attendance is waning, let's bring in a Christian rapper, buy some pizza, and that'll solve the problem for a little bit. It's, it's not, one, it's not a solution at all. Two, you're just hyping up their emotions, and then that creates apathy because if there are no good emotions, then who cares? And then on top of that, um, when you, when, I like what uh, Frank Turek says in my book, I quote him saying something to the effect of, whatever you win people with, you win them too, and you have to keep them by that method. And then I add to that is whatever you win them with, you can also lose them too. So if we quote unquote win people with concerts and pizza parties, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with concerts in themselves or pizza parties in themselves. But if that's our long term solution and we win them with, you know, concerts and pizza parties, then we can easily lose them to the next religion or secular, you know, uh, uh, event with a better concert and pizza party. And, and I guarantee you the church cannot compete with what the world has to offer in those areas, nor should it try. But if we win them with this, we have to try and continue to keep them with this. And then what we win them with, we can easily lose them too. And so I think that, again, creates apathy. It creates uh, you're chasing an experience. You're chasing an emotional high. You're chasing the next, um, you know, fill in the blank. Chasing the next, you know, what, what's the next... Uh, best concert, best youth camp, and you're really not even, I would dare say, chasing the things of God. You're chasing the things that satisfy you and what gives me that next fix. Yeah, and um, your uh, book, Evangelism, The Lazy Approach to Evangelism, this, uh, uh, all of us are called to be, to do the work of evangelists. That's right. Paul said that. We are all called to do the work. Of, it's not just on the part of the pastor, the elder, the bishop. <clears throat> Every person who professes to know the Lord Jesus Christ is called to do the work of an evangelist. And uh, if believers in Christ, true followers of Christ, were doing just that, mm -hmm. then we would see, I believe, our cities and communities change for the better. But look at America. We have churches almost on every corner. And our cities are still unchanged. Mm. Not to say that change is not taking place but it's sure. not taking place at a rapid pace that it could that's right and this right here is very bothersome now let me let me move on to something here real quick and again if we uh if if, if we have any other anyone else listening watch has questions please let us know i think a few just came in okay we're going to get to those questions um <coughs> actually let's get to those questions and then we'll get to my thoughts so Go ahead and read one of the questions, if you um, would. I, I didn't see the question, so if you see it. This was from someone that asked earlier. It says, thank you for answering my questions. I have one last question. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross for our sins to be forgiven? Couldn't God just have pardoned our sins without death? So, good question. <clears throat> um, a few things. A lot of times I think people erroneously isolate God's attributes or tries to separate God's attributes. Because, first and foremost... Um, sin is something that if there is to be justice, something must be punished. Something must be, th there has to be some payment for that, if you will. Um, so God is not just loving, he's also just. He's not just just, he's merciful. He's not just all-powerful, he's omniscient. Y you cannot separate God's attributes. In fact, atheists will often try and use this as an objection. I'm not saying the questioner is an atheist, but I, I don't know who he is. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't look at the name, but People say, well, how can God be both merciful and just? Because they seem to be contradictory. Without going into the idea of penal substitution, substitutionary atonement, views of the atonement, um, I forget how Ivan Plantinga put it, but something to the effect of if we have wronged someone and they have agreed to take on that punishment voluntarily in our place, then they have decided the type of payment they, they, they're willing to accept for X, Y, or Z. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, you see there seems to be this correlation between um, sin and death. 
And, you know, even death, just even if we just define death as a separation, be it between body and soul, the second death being, being between eternally us and God, um, <clears throat> there seems to be this idea, this reoccurring notion that sin brings about death of some sort, form, or fashion. So there are some things, if I can use a big word, that are just metaphysically connected. What does that mean? These are things beyond the physical realm, spiritual, if you will. That's not what metaphysical means, but just for the sake of, of kind of uh, being brief. So there seems to be this connection with sin and, and some type of a separation or death. And if God is just and there is sin and we have sinned against him, then to be just, there must be a punishment for that. There must be something that takes on that weight. And if God is going to be merciful, well, that's where we see him saying, well, I'll take on that punishment and sending his son and, and Jesus voluntarily dying on the cross for us. Again, lost to say, but uh, you go back to if, if we have wronged him, like people will say, um, for example, if, if I were to slap someone in the audience, you may call the cops, I may get a ticket, I, I may, I don't know, maybe I might get a slap on the wrist, I don't know. But if I were to slap the president, I'd get a much bigger sentence because it's the same action, but it's committed against a different person. So even if it's just one sin, it's not just the action, it is who you are committing against, and if God exists, he is an infinite being, an eternal being, and thus I would say it merits a similar kind of punishment, if you will. Um, so how do we remedy that? How, how, is that? how can God be both just and merciful at the same time? Well, if you get an infinite being stepping into human flesh that is perfect, without blemish or spot, just like we see in the Old Testament, who voluntarily takes on the, uh, uh, the payment for our sins, the propitiation of our sins, that takes on um, the weight of our sins as a payment, or if you, you know, however you want to hash that out in the atonement, then it is perfectly both merciful and just of God to punish sin and then give us the option to be redeemed by what Christ did on the cross as a gift in and of itself. Okay. All right. So uh, here's another question. Now, this is, uh, I was brought up to believe that there is a place between heaven and hell. Is there different levels of hell, total darkness, purgatory, lake of fire? Uh, where, uh, where is the second death? So, good question. Um, are there different levels of hell? I, I, I'm open to it. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a hard stance on it. I do think there are different degrees of punishment in hell. Uh, why do I think that? A, a few reasons. Um, and there, there's, this, this has applications to many, many areas. But, but one thing we do say, I would say, even in, in moral philosophy, you see that not all sins are equal. All sins, you know, people say, well, all sin is sin. That, that's true, but not all sins are equal. Because even when Jesus is talking to some of the religious leaders, he says, you know, your tithe, your, your mint, and your spices, but you have neglected the weightier matter of the law. Which means in Jesus' mind, there are some laws that take precedence over others, morally speaking. And so, again, without going to a whole thing into moral philosophy, um, you know, the Bible says, you know, thou shalt not sin, yet Rahab lies about the spies, and she sins, and what does God do? Well, he blesses her. Well, wait a minute, I thought you shouldn't sin. Well, in this instance, you have a, uh, two objective moral values butting heads, if you will, and I would say we are obligated to go with the weightier matter or the weightier moral obligation or value. So if I, can, if I can save human life and do that through lying, God is honoring the fact that you are aiming for the weightier moral principle that you're trying to aim for. And these are God's people. These are people made in God's image. So all that to say, I'm not saying lying's okay. Don't, don't, please don't misunderstand. It's not like God says, okay, I'm closing my eyes for five minutes. Sin as much as you can. It's that when these two things are butting heads, if you will, God is going to honor the intent and what you're doing and you are aiming at the weightier matter of the law, if you will. So there also seems to be this notion in Scripture that the more revelation you're given, the more responsibility you incur upon yourself. And I think you see this with Paul. I think you see this in Scripture. To him, much is given, much is required. Jesus says something to the effect of, you know, had these miracles been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. So it's going to be worse for you on the day of judgment. So there, again, seems to be this different level of punishment. And here's why I bring the, all this up, because I think it has deep application, especially apologetically, to what's called the problem of divine hiddenness. 
where um, I think it was a Schellingberg, an atheist philosopher, says that if God exists, he would not hide himself because he would be open and want to have a relationship with any and everyone. And so the argument is something like, if God exists, there shouldn't be any non-resistant non-believers, namely people who don't believe in God. They're not resisting God. And if God wants a relationship with everyone, then they would come into relationship because God would re reveal himself. However, there are non-resistant non-believers, and he would raise his hand, metaphorically speaking, and say, I'm one of them. Therefore, there's likely no God. So, with this in mind, um, I did a debate in May last year uh, where, where the atheist that I was debating brought this up as an objection. You can go see how I responded, but essentially in this way. One, God hiding is actually consistent with Scripture and Christianity. Isaiah says, truly you are a God who hides himself. Um, Jesus spoke in parables so that they would not turn and believe. What? Jesus, Jesus hid something so people wouldn't get saved? That's what it says. Don't... I'm not going to go into all the details there, but yes, there are times where God, God hides. And I would say just a short answer would be he was getting to the cross. And even it says later on, had the principalities of this world known what they were doing, they wouldn't have crucified him. So there was something about the fact that he kept some things secret, if you will, in order to, to accomplish what he was going to accomplish. So one, God does hide and we should expect that. So that's consistent with Christianity. And I don't think you can... Um, use something consistent with Christianity that it predicts as an objection against it. And two, here's where this goes back to hell and, and you know, the, the relevance here. If God is not just all loving, but all knowing, then take, you know, John Doe, who does not believe in God. And remember, God's goal is not just to get people to believe in him, but to be in fellowship with him. What's the difference? Well, even, even the demon, demons believe, but tremble. So belief is not the end goal for God. He wants fellowship, relationship. And so if John Doe does not believe in God, and God knows that if he were to give John Doe more revelation, and John Doe would still reject God, then John Doe has just now added to his condemnation in the afterlife. So if God knows that John Doe will reject God, even with more revelation, then ironically, it becomes a sign of God's grace and mercy to not give John Doe more revelation because in doing so, he is keeping him from further condemnation and punishment in hell. <clears throat> so even in, our, in, in this person rejecting God, he is still showing love and mercy to them by hiding. And also in that question, uh, she asked about purgatory. According to the Bible, there's no mention of purgatory. And uh, so I, I have to say that the Bible is our final authority. That's where we get our teachings and our doctrine. So the Bible does not teach purgatory. The, uh, there, there's different examples of uh, descriptions of hell. I believe the book of Revelation uh, gives uh, descriptions. Of course, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus that mm. you brought up a moment ago. And uh, that, but there is no, you know, she was asking if there is an in-between. Mm. And of course, according to the Bible... There's no, like, in between uh, heaven and hell. Right. So that's that would be the uh, simple, uh, sh the short answer, I should say, to that. Yeah. Okay, so I focus on the last part of the question, but you're right. She yes, yes. Question. So I want to make sure that uh, we brought that up as well. Listen, you know what? We're going to be on just for maybe another 10 minutes at the most. And again, so we're going to give you 10 more minutes if you have any questions that you'd like to ask or comments. But uh, again, I, I uh, appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, people like yourself, you know, Christian apologists, uh, people that uh, um, teach and uh, especially teach young people. You know, we we are losing, unfortunately, we, we are, the church is losing a generation of young people today because young people are not being equipped as they should be equipped mm -hmm. with the gospel. Like you said a moment ago, you know, we'll make pizza parties and we'll have concerts and all this entertainment, but after a while, that's going to lose its appeal. And uh, the congregation here at World Harvest in Delano, they know this, that uh, the means that you use to attract people is the mm. means that you've got to use to keep the people. Okay. So I want people to be attracted to the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to the scriptures. Uh, Jesus, when he was here on this earth, he knew that, um, that that was the way that he would attract uh, people to the gospel that he came you know truth and grace came through jesus christ but he also used and appealed to them using the scriptures and the right. only scriptures they had right. at the time 
was the Old Testament, what we refer to as the Old Testament. And so I, I, I appreciate uh, ministries such as yourself, and, um, but today we, we have a, 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 a church culture that has developed that believes that if it goes by emotions, which you mentioned at the beginning of this interview where the Mormons believe that uh, if you pray about the Book of Mormon, you'll feel a burning in your bosom, and that's evidence of its truthfulness. Well, no, it's 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 got to go deeper than that, and I and I see this also in a in a in a lot of uh, churches where uh, they they go by their emotions, they go by their feelings, they, you know, uh, and and that's that's not that, that's that's actually very troubling mm -hmm. when when people go by their emotions. We're admonished by John where he says beloved believe not every spirit but mm -hmm. test the spirits to see whether of God right. it says test all things hold fast to what is true and um, I hear ministers say well don't question me because if you question me you're touching God's anointed and the Bible says do not touch God's anointed now I'm bringing I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus but now I, I want to focus on the Christian church mm -hmm who will lift a scripture up like that and apply it to the 21st century pastors of today. <coughs> Don't question me, because if you do, you're touching God's anointed. How do you respond to that? <laughs> well, I like what I heard you once say. Well, I'm God's anointed too. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, there's, a, there's a, a lot of good books. Uh, one that, that immediately comes to mind is called Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes. And then a sequel to that was misreading scripture through individual eyes. And it just shows how we, we, we really take scripture out of context. We don't understand the historical setting. We don't understand who they're talking to. Because one thing people need to understand is scripture cannot mean today what it did not mean back then. We, we, we cannot, we're, we're not getting, if, if they wouldn't, if we can't say this means this today when it was totally foreign to them back in that day. Or anachronistic, you know, not in that time. You know, it would have made sense to them. Um, all that to say, yeah, when, when people, it's it's not too hard to see the arrogance, and you were talking about being pretentious within a lot of people. And you know, I, I'm reminded of Jesus when he cursed the fig tree. If you know, he doesn't curse the fig tree for not having figs, because it even says it wasn't the season for figs. He cursed the fig tree for having leaves appearing to have figs. And so he curses it, saying, you know, let no one eat food from you ever again. I, I think it, it can be almost more dangerous for people who, not that they're not, not, it's not just that they're not bearing fruit, but they're pretentiously acting as if they are bearing fruit, and upon closer inspection, all they have are leaves. And so, yeah, I, I, there, there are a lot of people who, you know, maybe have, they, they dress nice, smell nice, look nice, whatever, and interpret and use it as this means I'm anointed. Look at the physical reality look at the physical materialistic stuff and that is somehow a reflection of my quote-unquote anointing and I, I think if people just read their bible we can avoid a lot of charlatans like that or even hey look at me i'm i'm blessed because of what i own what i drive what i live in and uh, therefore i'm blessed um yeah i believe every good and perfect gift comes from the father above but uh, again jesus says a man's life does not consist in the abundance that That's he right. owns so uh, that's great that you have, you know, a nice house, but I can guarantee somebody has some, a house bigger than yours. Yeah. And that's not living for God. I right. think uh, Hugh Hefner sure. may have had the Playboy Mansion. So I'd like to ask the, 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 the preacher that believes that the more money you have, the more wealth you have, uh, that somehow um, you're blessed. So do you believe that Hugh Hefner, when he was alive, was, was he blessed by God too? Yeah, was he anointed did, by did, God? Was he anointed by God? Did God anoint his... Uh, business playboy <laughs> so uh, again uh, there, there's just so much misconceptions uh, within uh, some of the teachings in Christianity and, and again we admit to that we admit to that but that doesn't mean that Christianity uh, altogether is wrong right. it doesn't mean that Jesus Christ never lived and walked the face of this earth or resurrected 2,000 years ago but anyway okay in closing Eric uh, give people an opportunity to uh, write to you to how, how can they obtain uh, your book, and uh, will you charge extra to autograph it? <laughs> no, we'll not charge extra to autograph it. Um, they can go to the publisher's website, GC2 Press. You can just Google 
the lazy approach to evangelism or Eric Hernandez's lazy approach to evangelism. You can also go on Amazon. It's also on there. Uh, just either lazy approach to evangelism or Eric Hernandez evangelism and, and it'll pop up there. Okay. And then what we'll do is we'll include a, a link at, uh, at the, uh, uh, once this uh, is over, this interview is over, we'll include a link in the comment section below. Anybody that wants to uh, follow you, can they, you have a YouTube page? Yes, so they, uh, again, just type my name, Eric Hernandez, or youtube.com slash Eric Hernandez, E-R-I-C Hernandez, and they can look at debates I've done, some lectures I've given, discussions I've done, some in-house with other Christians on certain theological ideas, and but mostly either with non-believers, skeptics, agnostics on various topics, including abortion, Existence of the soul, existence of God, uh, the truth of Christianity, things of that nature. You do training. Yes. If a pastor would like for you to come and uh, speak to their mm -hmm. youth group, do you do that? Absolutely. And yes, you absolutely. train them. Yeah. Again, in a, in a minute or so, uh, explain to pastors uh, how that process is done, and if they would like to invite you to come, how can they uh, sure get thing. a hold of you? Um, so... In a nutshell, it depends on how much time I have and how many days I'm there. I've had some churches, they'll do a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I just came from Louisiana. I did something with their church, and it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, you know, a few sessions each day. Whatever the person would like to allow, whatever church would like to allow, I'd, I'd be more than happy. I, I want to equip the body of Christ. Um, it's not something that's incredibly difficult, but it's something we're all called to do. But it does take some thinking because we are called to love God with our minds. Um, to reach out to me, they can look me up on any social media platform, uh, Twitter or X as they call it now, Facebook, um, it, pretty much almost any, any platform. You can also go uh, on to uh, texasapologetics.org, um, and then there there's a contact button, and you can reach out to us, asking us anything there. And then my email will also be uh, on there as well if they want to reach out. Um Last year, boy, I tell you what, uh, the more I think, the more questions come up. But last year, um, at the time of this uh, taping is 2024. So last year in 2023, uh, you took a group of young people uh, to UCLA. That's right. What were you guys doing there? <clears throat> so uh, so this was part of the um, one of our MAVEN trips, and it was the apologetic mission trip. So I work with the ministry called MAVEN as well, and we do three different types of trips. That trip was the apologetic mission trip where we, again, it's, it's, it's what we believe, why we believe it, and then they study, again, some, some arguments for God's existence, some apologetics, and then they study some, read some atheist material, and then we go to UCLA, and we give the students, we put them in groups of two or three, we'll give them a radio and say, okay, it's 12 o'clock, you have two and a half hours, go get into conversations on campus, we'll see you back here in two and a half hours, if you get kicked off campus, let us know. We'll go pick you up when we're all done. And we just send them out, and they're out there talking to professors, to students. And these are high school students, mind you. Um, these aren't professional, you know, ministers. These are high school students learning this stuff, out there talking to other students, talking to professors, getting into evangelistic conversations. And then sometimes, sure, they come back, and they're like, man, I, I feel I really dropped the ball. And I always remind them, one, you don't know how the Holy Spirit used whatever you did. Two... How can we, how can we uh, um, work on that in the future? And I guarantee you, if they get beat up a little bit, I appreciate that because I guarantee you they will never forget that. And it almost drives their passion to want to learn more and reach the loss. It gives them a heart for the loss. I love it when I see a kid come back in tears and say, man, they just didn't get it. And I said, maybe not, but you planted a seed and let's keep going. Let's keep working. You know, uh, I, I'm reminded of uh, the first time I met you, uh, you had just had a debate with your former professor from the mm. University of Houston, I believe. Uh, it was, uh, I did one at the University of Houston, but that, that professor, it was uh, San Jacinto in Pasadena, Texas. Yeah, and uh, I remember that was, <clears throat> of course, since then, you've, you've had uh, multiple debates, and uh, again, anybody that wants to uh, check out some of your uh, previous debates, even debating the uh, attorney who was a woman that uh, stood for pro, who was a pro choice, pro -choice. believer right. she she believed in abortion and uh you really asked her some questions and i could tell that she had no answers to because right. you really just made her think mm. and she she seemed like she had no answer right. she she would just give a statement, but really not a valid answer and so uh you have i believe that those debates are available as well. Yep. 
Yeah, right. they're available. You can go to my website, Eric Hernandez, uh, ministries.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's the ninth chapter of my book or maybe 10th chapter. I actually, you know, uh, cover some of the, that interaction in the debate with her as well. But yeah, it was it was one of my favorite debates for sure. I got to pray with some young ladies afterwards. I uh, got to share the gospel with some people. And um, I had young ladies. This is at a secular college campus. This isn't a church or Christian event. And some young ladies came up to me afterwards and said, I came to this event either pro-choice or on the fence, and because of this debate, I'm leaving pro-life. You, you're for pro-life. That's right. They're becoming. That's you know. I, I think that was that's great. So you you really uh, have reached uh, people from all walks of life. So, mm-hmm. Eric, I want to thank you again for taking time out to join us and minister to our church congregation this morning, and then for this um, live interview. And again, people have ways of contacting you. And thank you again for joining with us uh, today. And I look forward to our next uh, visit. And uh, you've been a friend for a a long time. And uh, just pray that the Lord would continue to enrich and bless your ministry so that it will be fruitful, so that you guys can plunder hell and populate heaven. Amen. All right. God bless each and every one of you.